I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Peter Fulliger. Peter holds a PhD in geophysics from UBC. That's three UBC geophysics PhDs in a row, for those counting. Um, Peter's got over 30 years experience in exploration and mining geophysics. During the past 18 years, he has consulted privately and, and has developed geophysical inversion software. Uh, Peter is a, a member of several organisations and he's currently based in Vancouver. Thank you, Brenda. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, the title of my talk is Remnant Magnetisation Inversion at Camden, Queensland, or it could be called Camden Mag Revisited. And the background for this is that we were contracted by BHP to interpret their magnetic data at Camden in 2002 and took it as far as we could at that time with the available software. In particular, we were thwarted in the end by inability to model remnants as we wish to and also inability to take self-demagnetisation into account. So this is a talk about our efforts to overcome those problems and to revisit the, the data uh, in uh, 2014. So over, over a decade later, we came back and had an idea. <clears throat> so after an introduction, uh, talk about remnant magnetisation formulations, uh, validation and, and then discuss application of the software to uh, the Cannington Mag data. I'd like to acknowledge the permission of BHP Billiton to present the original material. Currently the mine is owned by South32 so I hope I'm not going to get in trouble with them. And I'd like to thank uh, Ken Witherly for access to his uh, Cannington case history slides. <clears throat> so just briefly talk about uh, options for remnant magnetisation uh, interpretation, both uh, unconstrained uh, and uh, con unconstrained options, which actually Nick has already uh, <coughs> briefly uh, summarised, and then also more constrained options for uh, source-specific interpretation when we have volumes of interest, geological units, uh, and in particular talk about uh, the approach we've developed. Oops, I'm just trying to find the, uh, the right button here for inversion for remnants of arbitrary 3D shapes. So remnant magnetisation interpretation, uh, normally we, we assume that magnetisation is purely induced. However, uh, as we know and as Nick has just uh, reminded us, <coughs> remnants can seriously compromise interpretations and if there is serious remnants uh, in, our, uh, in our geology, then if we ignore it, uh, we can in time at times get into a serious strife. <clears throat> if we know what the remnants actually is, if we can define the remnants thoroughly throughout our volume, then actually taking it into account is computationally not particularly difficult. The problem is that we rarely know much about the remnants. It's difficult to actually characterise it thoroughly. Collecting samples, getting them tested in laboratories is, is time consuming and expensive. So our problem is really that we, we, we just don't know uh, what the remnants is, how much it varies from place to place. Uh, that's more the problem than the actual computational issue ultimately. And to date, the focus has been more or less on trying to suppress the influence of remnants and trying to kind of circumvent the problem uh, in, in, in different ways. So in terms of unconstrained approaches, the, the idea here is normally to invert for some uh, quantity which is insensitive to direction of magnet magnetization. Uh, and the analytic signal has been uh, nominated as, as one, one quantity that we can derive from our magnetic data and it has the property that is, it is fairly insensitive to the actual orientation of the magnetization. <clears throat> so it'll be sensitive to magnitude, but fairly insensitive to the, uh, the orientation, and so that's a good thing. We can then invert for magnetization strength or amplitude uh, in our volume instead of inverting for susceptibility as we normally do. And that's a, a fairly good way to try and get around the, the problem. Another quantity is the uh, magnitude of the magnetic anomaly vector, and uh, Yadwa Lee and his students have demonstrated that that's probably even a better quantity to invert than the 3D analytic signal. But in either case, we're looking for something that's fairly insensitive to the direction of magnetization. <clears throat> Another option, as Nick mentioned, is to, to invert for an in situ magnetization vector, which can take into account or combine the effects of induced remnant magnetization and self demagnetization all at once. Um, so this is fine, and this can be, certainly can be very effective when you're looking for the uh, for interpretation of a discrete uh, anomaly. 
and give you a, a solution that can uh, take you forward and allow you to, to at least uh, take some sort of account of magnetization. But the actual uh, interpretation of that vector distribution may be a bit complicated. Um, and it may not be directly a, a very good indicator of remnants, given that there are other factors involved which can affect those, those uh, magnetization vectors in the ground. So this is a, you know, a, a worthwhile approach, can be very effective, but the actual interpretation of the data can be a little bit complicated. And the point is made here that when we calculate the response from our magnetic ground, we have the uh, in situ magnetization involved in the equations. And it's, it's, it's controlling the physics ultimately. And the magnetization in the ground is actually affected by the local magnitude of the <coughs> magnetic field. Now, if we've got fairly weakly magnetic material, then that magnetic field will be very, very close to the ambient field. But if we're in a situation with strong magnetic bodies and we've got self demagnetization uh, effects in particular, then we don't know what the, the direction of H is in the ground. And so, therefore, we're, we're unsure, ultimately, as to how to interpret our in situ magnetization in terms of our physical properties that we measure in the lab uh, using our um, known geomagnetic field. There's a little bit of complication in actually interpreting the geological meaning or the petrophysical meaning of the uh, inverted in situ magnetization. It's a little bit like having a model in electrical methods for the current and then trying to figure out what that means in terms of the conductivity. So the, 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 the quantities are related, but the relationship is a little bit complex. So in terms of source specific or constrained interpretation, we've got some defined volumes that we're interested in. Then clearly we've got the option of doing trial and error adjustment using a forward modeling algorithm. It's time consuming, but nonetheless valid. Uh, we can invert for remnants of simple <coughs> geometric shapes using some uh, existing software, doing parametric inversion. But we, we were faced with the problem that we wanted to uh, deal with complex geological shapes, complex geological bodies at Cannington, and there really wasn't anything that we could find to uh, calculate the response, remnant magnetization <coughs> response, which an arbitrary 3D shape. Uh, and in particular, to invert for the remnants of such a shape in order to uh, improve the fit-to-way data. So that's what we set about to develop. So the uh, formulation, which, or the method, we, we call remnant magnetization inversion, not terribly original, I guess. But the idea here is to invert for an arbitrary uh, oriented magnetization uh, or remnant magnetization in, in a volume, and, and then to uh, find the, the optimal magnetization within, a, within an entire volume, uh, assuming that the Q uh, is uniform throughout that volume. So we, we can allow for variable susceptibility within the volume, but we're assuming that Q is constant, in other words, that the remnant magnetization direction is constant throughout that volume. <coughs> We formulated it within the VPMG framework, and that is suitable for this uh, kind of problem because in VPMG, each cell in our model can be assigned to a geological unit, and that means that we can very readily identify which cells belong to a volume of interest and then assign uh, identical magnetic properties to all those cells within the unit. So we can easily keep track of our individual units and then invert the properties of units within this framework quite naturally. There are three different styles of inversion that uh, are available within the VPMG framework, and the one we're uh, using in this case is homogeneous unit inversion. So we're looking for the optimal properties uh, within uh, given units that have some uh, geological meaning. And we're going to, going to be in particular optimizing, first of all, the susceptibility, and then later on the, the remnant magnetization within given uh, geological units. <coughs> so we keep this during the Remnant inversion, we keep the susceptibility fixed, uh, and uh, we can also optimize for susceptibility as a starting point, or we can impose an R priori starting remnants if we wish, and finally we can take self demagnetization into account if we're dealing with highly magnetic, uh, uh, highly magnetic uh, situation. So to validate the approach, looked uh, at a couple of examples. Firstly, a zero susceptibility cube. Now, this has been published by uh, Rob Ellis from, from Geosoft. So, illustrating in this case that uh, taking the, the data and uh, assuming that we've got um, uh, a, a 
magnetised body on the ground, uh, run the magnetisation inversion and does in fact reproduce the, the unknown uh, um, magnetisation direction. So in this case it was at least in horizontal magnetisation. And this uh, is just to illustrate that the inversion of remnant magnetisation is highly non-unique. So we know that magnetics normally is extremely unique. What we're doing by allowing the remnant magnetisation to vary is of course introducing a whole new uh, dimension, a whole new infinity of solutions uh, into, into, the, into the mix. So of course we're allowing for a, even more non-uniqueness than we had for our original magnetic problem. And this is just one of the other possible solutions. We say if we if we assume there's no remnants, we've got purely induced magnetisation, we still can get a, a perfectly good fit to the data. Uh, this is uh, now assuming that we have a, a, a cube um, model, and then this is showing the results from the, the remnant magnetisation, and here's the true, uh, the true parameters for this uh, cube. So we've got 47 versus 50, and, and we've got the correct... Um, uh, declination, declination for that. So that's a successful synthetic inversion. And the other approach that we've uh, implemented is uh, for the 3D analytic signal or the total magnetic <laughs> gradient. And again, for the same data set, <coughs> uh, illustrating here that we can, if we convert the data to the 3D analytic signal, then again we, we can recover uh, a sensible representation of that. Uh, magnetic cube. So now we're inverting purely for the amplitude of our, of our magnetization in the body. And we're not, in, we're not inverting here for susceptibility, but for the, the amplitude of our magnetization vector. But again, a, another possible approach to kind of circumvent the, uh, the magnetization or remnant issue as much as we can. So the uh, inversion of the Kennington ground magnetics, now to illustrate it on some real data, as I mentioned, we originally were given a brief to interpret the Cannington magnetics in 2002. At that stage, it was more or less a due diligence exercise by PHP. They were just trying to make sure that they hadn't missed uh, anything in the magnetic data. Um, and they had, at, at about that time, discovered a small block of ore uh, just off their, 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 their faulted southern end of their deposit. And so they were just being uh, ultra careful that there wasn't something in the magnetic data they had pri previously missed. And as I said, we revisited the issue in 2014 with uh, improved software which could handle both uh, inversion for remnant magnetization and also self demagnetization. So, Cannington is a, a soil lead zinc mine, a broken hill type proterozoic mine. It's located in the in the Mount Isa block in, in northwestern Queensland. Uh, it was discovered by BHP in 1990, and this was really a follow-on from a, an earlier discovery uh, of the Eloise deposit, which is an IOG, IOGC, a copper gold deposit in the northern, well, to the north of Cannington. And following on from that deposit, BHP expanded their aeromagnetic coverage to the south and ultimately uh, picked the Cannington, which has a, or just see, there's a very small magnetic anomaly, at least on this scale, <coughs> and then successfully uh, jagged the silver lead zinc mineralization and uh, went on to open the mine for production in 1997. The, uh, here, here's a, a geological plan. The main thing to notice is that the deposit is divided into two zones, northern and southern, by the Trapel Fault here. Uh, and the deposit is extremely <coughs> heavily uh, structured. It's been folded and faulted uh, multiple times. Uh, and you can see a, a folded structure here, visible particularly in the south end. In terms of reserves, the pre-mining reserve is shown here. Uh, the current reserve uh, below, and you can see that in terms of tonnages, it's actually uh, increased, so it's obviously a sustainable resource. But in terms of grade, there's been a loss of grade in, in terms of silver and zinc, uh, but the lead grade has barely changed at all. So it's still, still in production and it's still an, an important uh, uh, silver and lead mine, as you can see up here for many years, it was touted as the world's largest and lowest cost producer of silver, silver and lead. I don't know if it still is, but certainly it's an important, uh, it's an important deposit. <coughs> so here we have a, 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 a section, a horizontal section through the deposit. Perhaps you can see more clearly the, the folded nature of it. 
Uh, on the right are the, uh, the uh, is the geological, or I should say, more, more, more mineralogical classification of the deposits. So most of these uh, classes are in fact ore type classes. Uh, so we have some um, barren mythological uh, types to find, but in the main, these are uh, ore type classes, and it was the ore type, <coughs> the ore type classes that we were trying to understand in terms of their magnetic properties and their magnetic remnants. Uh, in the inversion, we did have available to us uh, petrophysical data from both core samples and uh, a few downhole logs. But we had a lot of trouble making sense of the data for various reasons. Um, as is often the case at mines, we had a number of different campaigns of, of different samples which were analysed by different uh, contractors using different equipment. Uh, so there were some issues in terms of just uh, data quality, data consistency. Probably the most fundamental problem was that the, the holes that, uh, for which we had you know, uh, susceptibility and other uh, information were drilled in the, in the early days before they'd actually defined their uh, classification of ore types. And so we <coughs> had a lot of difficulty actually relating our data to their geological or mineralogical classification. And so this, this created a bit of strife. <coughs> now this is showing that the southern zone uh, now in vertical section, so again you can see uh, the folds and the uh, distribution of, of different ore types within the syncline. And the most, ma most magnetic units are the, the Burnham and Nithsdale, and they're concentrated uh, on this uh, western uh, limb primarily. You probably can't read this slide, but this is a, a bit more of a description of the uh, nature of the different uh, mineral uh, zones. Uh, they're divided basically into, into lead-rich and zinc-rich loads and the, uh, the lead-rich loads are the ones that are more highly magnetic and uh, more conductive. And so uh, they're the ones that are of most uh, interest in terms of our current uh, exercise. And in particular the Burnham and the Nisdale are the ones that uh, prove to be the most highly magnetic. But this uh, classification also highlighted a few difficulties again in terms of relating our petrophysical data to our mineral uh, types of local classification. There'd obviously been some classification creep over time and this again is a quite characteristic at mines that you find that the, the geological P changes with time and it's not just a factor of geologists moving through or people being inconsistent. It's also the understanding changes and usage changes and so we found that these definitions Oops, these definitions were not adhered to uh, absolutely strictly or religiously. We found that uh, material that should have been weakly magnetic was highly magnetic and vice versa. So we got into a whole a series of uh, complications in terms of using the petrophysical control data that we had in a sensible fashion. In particular, signing things like upper and lower bounds on our inversions uh, became quite, quite uh, vexed. But um, that's, that's real life, uh, particularly if you're doing work at mines. <coughs> so our model was comprised of 24 different mineral or geological units. And we were inverting for uh, their properties only, their magnetic properties only. We didn't alter the geometry. So as you might have noticed on a previous slide, one of the options within VPNG is to sh change the shapes. To clearly, uh, at mines, it's been pretty, pretty thoroughly drilled. And so there wasn't really much uh, opportunity to, to use that, uh, that type of inversion. So there are really four stages. Uh, firstly, a homogeneous unit inversion to optimise the susceptibility uh, within each unit. Then a second stage, of this time of remnant inversion, to optimise the remnants of the seven units with uh, high uh, susceptibility, high magnetic uh, properties. <laughs> the third stage was in, to introduce heterogeneous inversion, so now we're allowing the susceptibility to vary within those units. Previously it had been assumed to be uniform within the, each unit. And then finally to allow the remnants of those units, which were now heterogeneous, now variable, uh, in susceptibility, to allow the remnants of those units to, to be optimised in terms of uh, data fit. So the initial stage was pretty revealing. Um, we got the susceptibility data all together and we computed a forward model using those best available susceptibilities. And this is the forward model result, which doesn't compare very favourably at all with the measured data. <coughs> and this is quite a substantial anomaly on the ground. 
uh, it's probably something like 2,500 nanoteslas uh, in, in peak to trough. So clearly there was something quite seriously wrong with our susceptibility data. And by then running a homogeneous optimization, so saying, well, what's the, the, the optimal susceptibility for each of those units, we were able to quite quickly improve the fit and get, it, get the uh, cabulated responses to this stage. So that's a very useful form of inversion when you're in this situation where you've got a geological model which really has a lot of validity, but you, you're, you're not confident at all about your initial properties. You can get from a, a very poor point to a quite a reasonable point very rapidly by saying, well, let's optimize the susceptibility of each of those units rapidly. Uh, and in this case, we had only 24 parameters mm -hmm. active. We had 24 units. We were optimizing 24 parameters. So in terms of inversion, it's a small undertaking. So that's quite an effective starting point. Um, so here's the observed and calculated uh, data after our 2002 inversion. And so you can see that it's, it's not uh, ridiculously bad, but clearly we have not done a very good job of fitting the uh, southern uh, uh, peak, which is the most intense part of the anomaly. So there's, hence there's more work to be done. And that's the residual at that stage. Uh, these are the susceptibilities which were assigned to those two most magnetic units. Um, and then there's the misfit, and at this point we, we weren't able to uh, take self-demagnetisation into account. This is where we revisited it in 2014, now with self-demagnetisation. It's made a, a, some uh, qualitative differences. Uh, but in terms of overall fit, it's not, not much changed. It isn't, hasn't really improved a great deal. So the self-demagnetisation on its own hasn't done a great deal to improve the fit, although we feel more confident that at least we're taking that into account. But I think to understand why self-demagnetisation is not doing very much here, it, it's because the, the strike is not too far off uh, north-south, so that the ambient field is, is actually oriented more or less parallel to strike, and so it's not really having a great effect on those uh, slabs, that, those, that material dipping uh, into that, into that uh, southern zone there. So I think that's the explanation. Okay, so after we would run uh, remnant magnetization on that, those homogeneous units, we improved the fit somewhat. It's now dropped yeah, from 90 plus to uh, just below 80. Uh, and again, here's the, uh, the data in profile. There's the residual on the left there. Uh, now running uh, homogeneous, sorry, heterogeneous units and now allowing the susceptibility to vary within those units. Uh, probably can't see very much difference between these two, but there is some change there, uh, particularly in this, this vicinity. You can see that it has introduced some uh, heterogeneity into the, into the body, uh, and we've, we've reduced the, the misfit uh, significantly. And then running now the uh, remnant magnetization version, so allowing the remnant properties within each of those magnetic units now to be optimized, uh, we've improved the fit uh, quite Appreciably, we've got it down to, to 40 or so. We still haven't got a perfect result, but we've, we've made some, uh, some major progress. So there's the summary uh, observed data, our starting point in 2014, and then uh, our final result there, which is at least qualitatively looking pretty good. <coughs> Just another couple of views of that uh, transition. So there's the 20, uh, 2014. Um, sorry, couple of TMI after 2014 homogeneous inversion. Okay, that's, that's the initial stage, and then this is uh, our final stage uh, with showing the improvement. <coughs> you can see the improvement here on the right-hand side in terms of the profile data at that uh, for that particular section. So here, here is a summary table of the uh, the results for the magnetic units. So you can see the susceptibility in this column in, in 10 to the minus 3 SI. So clearly the Burnham and Nithsail are the standout magnetic units with um, susceptibilities over 1 SI. And their remnants, their inferred or inverted remnants are, uh, magnetizations are reasonably similar, not identical, but both westerly and one moderately up, the other moderately down. And the others are quite different, quite variable uh, through the deposit, both in the north, northern uh, units and the southern units. 
And of course, you'd be interested to know how these compare with the magnetic remnant determinations that were done on cores. And the answer is not terribly well. So these are the 11 uh, remnant magnetization results uh, which were uh, read, measured by uh, Don Emerson on, on behalf of BHP. And uh, these are quite different, uh, but there's an indication of east and upwards uh, remnants in terms of the Nithsdale in particular. However, if you look at this table a bit more closely and, and interpret what this column really means, the susceptibilities of these samples are all quite small. So in fact, a 40,000 uh, micro gauss induced magnetization translates into a susceptibility of 80 milli, milli SI or in other words 0.08 SI. So these are not particularly magnetic samples. So we've got a situation here where in order to understand the bulk response of the deposit, these samples aren't really helping us a great deal. So we're in, a, in a, I guess, a fairly familiar situation where we just don't have enough hard remnant magnetization data to really uh, give us what we, you know, the, the, the data we need to uh, an absolutely uh, robust job. So, of course, I favor the inverted remnant magnetizations, but you can make up your own minds. Okay, so just to summarise, we, we know that remnants is an important consideration in magnetics. We know that if we don't take it into account, we can sometimes uh, get into serious strife. Uh, but the remnants parameters are rarely known. Uh, there are two fairly well established strategies for coping with remnants. Either inverting for quantity that is responsive to the amplitude of the magnetisation, or to invert for an <coughs> magnetisation vector. Uh, and then we have developed software to uh, cope better with situations where we have a degree of control of some uh, geological starting position to allow us to uh, invert remnants on arbitrary shaped uh, volumes. Uh, an RMI, the, the aim of the inversion is to find an optimal remnants within a, within a 3D volume, and we're assuming that the Q is uniform throughout that volume, so the, the remnant magnetization is constant in direction. It's often combined with uh, optimization of susceptibility. We can take susceptibility magnetization into account if we need to. And at Cannington, we've ach achieved a, a much improved fit to the data by applying this approach to the, to the magnetics. So by allowing the, uh, particularly the Nithsdale and Burnham uh, types of mineralization to, uh, to achieve or to uh, adopt uh, remnant magnetizations. Uh, and the inferred remnants on that basis appears to be west and gently dipping for those for those two units. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Peter. We got time for some questions. Peter, I was just uh, I found you know when we looked at the susceptibility data, the core samples, it was disappointing as well, but. We didn't do as much modeling with it, but just lack of consistency between the different campaigns. And is that something that you've observed in general? That, that a lot of effort goes into this, but is the, are those data sets particularly useful for this sort of exercise, or have you done this enough to generalize about that? Well, I think there's really no alternative. So I guess we have to say they're useful, but it's just that there are many, many pitfalls. That's, that's the problem. Uh, and one one that I didn't mention is just degradation of core um, when it's stored. So depending on exactly what uh, your organization is, then of course you can, you can degrade just simply by drying or being too humid or, or oxidizing. And then in itself could be a problem. Um, but you know, other things that I'm sure you've encountered Ken too are just calibration issues on, on instruments. So you, you, you're given, a, you're given the, the calibration constant, but you, you just don't believe it, but you don't know what the true one is. Um, and just uh, uh, different uh, core samples. So sometimes all you've got is chips rather than solid core. Uh, and then the problem was, the most serious problem for us was the difficulty relating our samples back to something that was uh, currently geologically or, or mineralogically meaningful at the site. So there, there are many, many problems that, uh, that tend to arise and they're compounded by longevity of my life. So you have campaigns that were done 10 years ago and you're trying to relate those to current day campaigns. But 
there really, in many cases, isn't an alternative because actually logging the holes in the mine can be impossible for other reasons. Some mines automatically grout their holes uh, within hours or days of, of, of uh, measure of drilling them. Uh, other sites don't like having um, extra crews underground or you know, on the surface. Uh, casing is another issue. If you don't have casing, then the holes collapse. I mean, there's a whole suite of things, whole suite of problems that arise, and so often core samples are the only alternative. So yeah, they are useful, and we just have to make the best of it. Peter, I've got a quick question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you looked into it, you probably did. The source of the remnants, you think it was the pyrotype or the magnetite or both? Pretty much the magnetite, I would say. There is certainly some trace pyrotite in the Burnham and that stuff, but I don't think it's significant. So, but I, did, I didn't look into it specifically, but I would, I would expect that it's the magnetite. Do you know if it's a fine grained magnetite or is it coarse? What's the texture? I, I, I don't know. The actual Q, you might have noticed the predicted Qs there were quite low. So I, I suspect it's not particularly fine grained, but at the end of the day, I don't know for sure. Thank you. Yes? The, the, uh, the samples that Don Emerson did, the, the paleomag, that was a paleomag investigation, was it? That, that's what he was doing? Was he getting age dates on these things and trying to. No, I don't believe so. I think he was just asked to characterise the remnants on those samples. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. In, you mean in the inversion or in the...? Well, I mean obviously if you do the whole stratigraphy and the remnants of pre-folding, then you're going to have the northern limb and your southern limb and they're going to be quite... Did you try yeah. splitting up the north and the southern limb? And no, we didn't, but I mean that's a very good point. So if we did have pre-folding remnants and it was preserved during the folding, then yeah, you're right, then it would be re reversed in terms of inclination on either side of the fold. So that's something that we didn't look into. but but it's, in this case, it's the southern or the western limb of the, of the syncline that's dominant. So I don't believe that would make a big difference, but you, you're quite right that you could look into that and s split it into uh, you know, west and eastern limbs and try it again. Yeah, and you get confused by anoscopy too, right? Yeah. You're worrying how much of that. That's right. That. There are other, other complications. Yes? Did you do a magnetic vector inversion to compare the results? No. But in this case, given the amount of geological uh, understanding of a very, very well-defined model. I, I don't know that that would really add very much. It would give us some sort of log in the ground, depending on how it was conditioned. Uh, whereas we obviously wanted to relate it as far as we could to the, to the mine geology. Well, thanks okay. again, Peter.